Hello, and welcome to Dear Franny, the podcast where I have uncommon conversations about love with fascinating people. I'm your host, Francesca Hoagie. So today I am talking to Tazima Paris, and this is my second conversation on the podcast with Tazima because the first one was so good, I needed more Tazima in my life, and so do you. Today's conversation, we talk about worthiness and personal exploration and bravery and more about sex, more about intimacy, more about communication. So if you didn't hear my first episode with Tazima, you don't need it to listen to this one, but you definitely should go listen to it because it's so damn good. All right, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Tazima Paris. If you are a listener of the podcast, you will recognize from the last time she was on Tazima Paris. Welcome to Dear Franny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming back. Your first interview was really amazing and informative and enlightening. And if anyone is listening has not listened to that episode, please go back and listen to it. I mean, listen to this one too. Make sure that you also listen to the other one because Tazima, you were dropping so much knowledge. <laughs> my pleasure. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. Did I say that my name is Francesca Hoagie? Not yet. Oh, I didn't say that yet. Okay. So I'm Francesca Hoagie. <laughs> This podcast is still new, <laughs> and I used to have a podcast called Romantical. I got into like a rhythm of doing the intro to Pro Romantical, and I did it pretty well every time. And then ever since I started with Dear Franny, I just go right into the conversation. I think I'm just so excited to talk about, <laughs> um, to talk to you. Totally. Tazima, so you are, you are a coach. You work with high achieving heterosexual women over 40 who are professionally successful, but they struggle in their romantic lives. And you've been researching sex and human behavior for 20 years. You help your clients find love, increase intimacy, and have more satisfying sex. Yes, Tazima. <laughs> Thank you for carrying the torch for all of these amazing things that we need more of. You are a sought after expert. You've spoken at over 100 events in just five years. And Tazima presents talks, facilitates workshops yeah. and coaches clients across the United States, Canada and Mexico. Ah, Tazima. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so when last time you were here, we had a really comprehensive conversation. And we talked about sex, the pleasure gap. We talked about physiological, psychological, hormonal differences between men and women. I mean, we talked about orgasm. We talked, I mean, it was awesome. <laughs> like I said, if you have not listened to this episode, that first episode with Tazima, you should. But today I really wanted to get your perspective on another topic, which is related to everything, of <laughs> love related, but it's something that's been coming up a lot lately in conversations that I'm having with women and not even women who are clients necessarily, just women that I'm out meeting and having, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of be like, oh, what do you do? And we kind of have a little bit of a talk and it's all about worthiness. Yeah. Essentially, that's what it is. And so first I noticed it because every woman I was meeting was going, well, I just don't know what to do because I only like guys who don't like me and always, I feel like I'm always chasing and then it doesn't work out. And I was like, oh, okay. I, yeah, obviously I know this pattern, right? This is like what 90% of my clients are dealing with. <laughs> and then in just in like a couple of minutes though, this is what the part that's really surprised me in a couple of minutes when I just asked them, you know, we have these short conversations, but they get to the point where they're just like, I'm just not sure that I have enough self-worth. And I've been really surprised that someone could come to that conclusion so quickly, right? Like really realize like, this is what's going on. My, I'm struggling with feelings of worthiness, but they just don't know how to deal with it, right? Obviously, you know, when I work with my clients, when you work with your clients, mm -hmm. this is the work that we do over time. But I, I wanted to have a conversation about it today with you on this platform, because obviously we can't work with everyone. And not everyone even knows that this is an issue that is coming up for them because they're not necessarily getting to that place of realizing, oh, this is about worthiness, right? So I'm really interested to hear your take on self-worth and you know how it relates to love and how what's your advice for people to starting to cultivate more of that sense of worthiness? Yeah, worthiness is such an interesting subject, specifically because I think it is so slippery. People can get the concept pretty pretty easily, like confidence. That's a 
pretty simple one. You either feel confident or you don't. But worthiness kind of lurks in the shadows. It's sort of like you think on the outside or like what you're projecting out into the world is, yes, I totally deserve what's coming to me and things are well. But then when things are not working out, then we have these quiet questions in the back of our mind about whether or not am I really good enough really ties back to our root the core of our wounding as human beings. Just to (laughs) lay the groundwork here, uh, one thing that happens in everyone's life, no one escapes this because we're all human beings and this is how we, literally how we survive, is that before we become, somewhere before 14 generally, but usually somewhere between five and seven, we make a, a life decision. Something pretty big happens in our world. And for us, it could literally be our parent saying or some person in authority saying no to us when we wanted something as small as a, and I say small as, you know, something that we wanted, an object that we didn't get, a disappointment, whatever it is. And then we make a decision from our five to seven year old self, sometimes nine, sometimes like 11, 13, but it's usually something really young. And we make this decision about our life that this is never going to happen again, but it, our self-worth is tied to that thing. So for me, I share that, you know, mine sort of the goggles that I wear in the world is like my own worthiness is tied to whether I'm good enough. And so I became a perfectionist in order to combat the, am I good enough? That's question. so common, yeah. especially for women. That is a very common default setting. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. And that yeah. is actually tied directly to the worthiness thing. Because if I don't feel like I'm good enough, then it just doesn't matter like how many compliments I get or the achievements I've made. They just don't matter. And interestingly for me, I got affirmation from all kinds of people growing up slash in my young adult life and in my current middle adult years. And the only person that actually made a difference with the affirmation was literally my dad. <laughs> like I got like people yeah. lining up around the corner yeah. to affirm me, but I because I wasn't getting it specifically from my dad and by the way I have a wonderful relationship with my dad now. He's totally on board even though I was terrified to tell him I was a sex and intimacy coach. He's totally awesome. <laughs> oh my god. And a fan yeah. of me and I just <laughs> I love my dad so much. So even that relationship has transformed. It's not like he was a jerk before. I mean, he just, you know, he's a dude who's living yeah. his life and I was having my own thing and my own story in my mind about my worthiness and that specifically needing to be validated by my dad. So we all have our own version of this. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the root of our sort of relationship woes, especially around deservingness, worthiness. Can I attract the right person or concerns around why am I attracting all these losers? What is happening that I can't attract someone who I can be really proud of and have a relationship I can brag about? How can I do this? And there are a lot, a lot of factors that we can get into in this conversation, but I definitely wanted to, you know, set the framework with that. Yeah, you're exactly right. I totally agree with what you're saying, especially about how one little thing can happen, you Mm -hmm. know, exactly quote unquote little thing can happen at our childhood and our childhood minds trying to make sense of it, make a decision about how the world is, about how our place in the world, our value in the world. And I think a lot of us also, I think our adults in our lives, even well-intentioned ones, could have wind up reinforcing that by being very reward oriented, exactly. you know, especially as kids, it's like, oh, you get, if you got this, you get this good grade or, oh, look at this, you have this accomplishment and this is that impressive and that isn't that impressive. And, you know, honestly, you know, I even like, I think about myself and my own family and that was, it, my parents weren't super reward oriented, mm-hmm. but there were, I was a kid who had talents that were like not visible to the naked eye. And I had family members who their talents were visible to the naked eye. Like my brother was an amazing artist. My mom was an amazing singer. My sister was a singer. And I was like, I'm just, I don't know, smart. Yeah. <laughs> right? Siblings, damn it. Right. I think for me, I just made a decision at a very young age that I didn't have talent. 
that was my decision. And so I said, I just need to find my ways of being in this world where I can still get some validation because I'm not going to get it just by being me. I think that's a really common thing. And that does tie into those feelings and it bleeds into relationships as we get older. I'm only valuable to this person if I look a certain way, if I particular type of provider or particular type of nurturer or all of these different, all of these different things. What's your advice to, because for me, I think that just recognizing that and recognizing that it's something deep seated is so helpful. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that really helps me to like call bullshit on myself, you know, <laughs> like, cause I'm like, listen, this is all programming that I, that's been since I was five years old and didn't know any better. So uh, it's time for me to move past this. But for people who they're like, okay, I understand where it comes from, but I still don't know what to do about it. What's your advice? Number one, this is PSA, my public service announcement for everyone. When you become aware of these early seeded issues, challenges, perspectives, early wounding, whatever you want to call it. When you become aware of it, recognize that you're never going to get over it. It's never going to be over. I just want to <laughs> put that out there because <laughs> it's never going to end. It's never going to end. <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean to sound hopeless about it, but I want to be somewhat realistic because we live in an, a goal oriented society. If it doesn't, just like you were saying, if you don't have visible talent, Talent, it doesn't count. In my mine was really countable because my family is track and field oh, wow. family. It's countable to the millisecond. To the millisecond, K? <laughs> right? Wow, that's yeah. been hard. <laughs> totally. So, you know, I'm born into a track family and I can't run fast. Are you kidding me? Oh, no. What an insult. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm slow. And by the way, it's math and fast legs. And I didn't get either. <laughs> I was like, damn it. So you never get over the thing that whatever that thing is, you never get over it. But what you do get is better. Once you recognize it, you get better at recognizing it. You get better at catching it in the moment. I, the main thing I want to start with is if you want to make a difference, stop trying to get it over with. Stop trying to fix it forever. There's nothing to fix. You're okay. Other really validating thing that I've learned in my own personal growth work is that my experiences make me uniquely qualified to help people in my area of expertise, period, hands down, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I used to be a yoga teacher, the fact that I wasn't a track star or a professional dancer gave me like the real factor of yeah. like, oh, you have a regular body, great. <laughs> I can relate to you because my leg won't go behind my head. I'm like, oh, right, yeah, right. I had to work to get mine behind my head. And if I don't do this for three weeks, it won't it go won't back go there. Behind <laughs> It's so true. Every yogi out there, we all can uh, relate to that. Feel you, feel you. <laughs> so that's the first part. You're never going to get it over. It's never done. And by the way, if it is, it means you're. it's time to die. Game over. <laughs> like... <laughs> I yeah. actually, I do say this about fear. I'm like this whole mm -hmm. idea that we have of like conquering fear. It's like, no, fear makes you human. We totally. all have fear. Yeah. The point is not to try to conquer fear. It's yeah. try to recalibrate your tolerance for it, right? Exactly. <laughs> have it lose its power over you so it's mm -hmm. not the one in the driver's seat all the time. But, yeah. you know, don't try to erase it. Yeah. That's just not going to happen. Totally. Yeah. And then the next yeah. step, once you recognize the thing, and it is important to do this work. So I highly recommend that I believe in therapy and coaching. Both of them together really help out. If you can only do one at a time, for example, if you happen to be so privileged that you can get both at the same time, it's awesome because you need someone to help you find what it is. There are also wonderful programs, personal growth programs that you can take. So at least you can start discovering what your personal script is and so that you can then start working on it. Once you recognize whatever the script is, whatever your personal, oh, I'm not good enough, or I, I don't matter, or other people are more important than me, any of those pieces, anything like that, or whatever your personal one is, there are only a handful of <laughs> mistaken beliefs out there. You all have them. They just take mm -hmm. on different flavors and <laughs> That's why the human experience is so cool, is that we can all relate to one another. Actually, is a, a platform for us to connect uh, mm -hmm. around the, our mistaken beliefs, but don't stay there. <laughs> don't yeah, wallow in the mistaken beliefs. Yeah. Really quick, I have to, because I don't want to forget. I recommend this book all the time, but I really can't recommend it enough. It just, what you said about only, us only having a handful of beliefs reminded me. The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Have you read this book? I have it, but I haven't read it. I this book it. was 
so game changing for nice. my life and for and it has been for so many others because I like make everyone I know read it. So The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, I really, really recommend it. And OK, <laughs> continue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the, yeah. the one that I'll recommend also wherever you are in the country doing a landmark forum, you only have to do the first one and then you can leave. It doesn't <laughs> don't feel like you have to keep going, but it does help you to get that one script thing. And a lot of people have done it anyway. The point being, once you get whatever your core stake and belief is, then it's about starting to be conscious about where it shows up and how it shows up. And you'll be shocked, shocked and appalled, (laughs) shocked to see how many places it shows up and in what situations. And usually it has to do with a change of expectation. Like, oh, I thought this was going to happen. And then your mind jumps in and says, the reason why it happened this way is because you suck for whatever reason. And so that is really the beginning of starting to shift the needle and starting to shift your degree of worthiness, your degree of I'm okay enoughness, I'm enough. Anything along those lines is going to start that. It's really about bringing consciousness to the moment and it really is insidious. And this is one of the reasons I love human beings is because this is basically all of us have something like this. And it it helps me to feel even closer to all my human brothers and sisters, (laughs) no matter (laughs) where they are in in life is we all have this common thread of, you know, not feeling worthy or enough or, or connected or lovable, any number of of thoughts that plague us. There are so many. Quick follow up question to one thing you said there. Mm -hmm. You said if someone had to choose between coaching and therapy, which would you recommend? Yeah, for folks who pretty much as many subjects as you as there are in our lives, you can get a coach or therapist who specializes in that. So don't feel like my problem is so bad that no one can help me. I promise you there is someone out there who has lived a similar enough life to you that they can really help you to move through these things. If you have, everyone has trauma, but if you have a lot of trauma that has you very stuck, I would not only check out a therapist, but also I would check out people who do healing modalities that don't require words because some of this stuff is literally pre-verbal. People, especially who were either adopted very early on or, um, were, you know, as babies or some physical illness happened when they were very, very young, that kind of stuff is going to be pre-verbal. So you're going to need a modality or a person who specializes in things that are not verbal talking, yeah. talk therapy. I'm going to recommend sound therapy, mm-hmm. sound healing. And I'm all about that because I'm in the process of getting my sound healing practitioner. Sweet certification but also reiki is a really powerful process for a lot of people yep. um, yeah but there are there are a lot of those i think it is incredibly helpful for some people they just need to feel it in their bodies yep like it's, they can't it's massive. they can't think it they have to feel it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and then for if you've got specific things you want to work on again look for a therapist or a coach who is is in that field and the distinction for me between therapy and coaching is what is the time frame that you're looking at what where are you looking are you looking at stuff that has stopped you in the past that would be therapy. If you are creating a plan for the future, that's a coach. That'd be coach. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it yeah. depends I on where you're a really going. Great way of coaches really, look yeah. from here forward. Mm-hmm. Therapists look from here past so that you can get the junk out of the way so that you can take the next step. So if you feel like you got the shackles on, <laughs> then it, <laughs> it might be time to look at, at a therapist. But there are some coaches that do healing modalities that will handle some of that stuff so that you can move forward. So it really, yeah. it really turns out to be like, what's the time frame that is presenting the biggest challenge right now? I totally agree with that. A lot of people say that they say to me, well, it sounds like you're like a therapist. I'm like, I'm not like a therapist at no, all. Not at all. Um, <laughs> because yeah. coaching is about action. It's moving forward to mm-hmm. achieve specific goals. It's not, you know, it's not about revisiting the past over and over. I saw a therapist once for maybe about six months or so. She mm-hmm. wasn't a good fit for me. We had a personality clash. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. Listen, you have to find the right person for you. And I've, I haven't been back to therapy since, but I'm a big believer in therapy. And I, I want other people to go to therapy. <laughs> I I wonder if I'm in denial. I just, I haven't felt the desire to go back into therapy. And I wonder if I'm in denial or if I'm just so forward focused, I think is what I'm all about the present and the future. Like that's my, I want to learn the lessons from the past, but I don't want to stay there. I don't know. Hence you being a coach and I hate processing. 
and overthinking because I mm-hmm. lived there for so long. I lived in the processing for so long. Oh I my hate God. it Me so too. much. Me too. And so hence, th- this is why I'm a coach is I yeah. want to not process. I want to, that's fine. Let's build something that will move in the place where you are right now. Therapy is great for a lot of people. And it might be about checking out a therapist so that you can find out whether it's even going to be for you. And like I said, there are therapists for all kinds of subjects, whatever you need, whatever you want to create. There are people who address those things. I Yeah, there is someone for every topic. It is, yeah. It's definitely true. Yeah. Going back for a moment to the topic of worthiness, I think one thing that I always like to have people ponder mm-hmm. is just the question of where does worth come from? Like not mm. for you personally, but what like if you picture a newborn child, right? What does that child need to do to be worthy of love and respect? And Usually they're like, oh, well, nothing, right? I'm like, okay, you were that newborn child, right? (laughs) So what happened, right? And I think, but then other people say, I don't know. I mean, I think you get worth from helping other people and achieving things. Mm -hmm. And so I said, so that baby isn't worthy until they are able to achieve things. Mm -hmm. Obviously it gets complicated for people, but how do you help frame for people kind of the, just that very basic question, like where does our value as humans come from? Mm -hmm. It's, it goes back to what I was saying about being uniquely qualified for the thing that we're really good at and that we can help and support people. There's an author, I can't remember who it is right now, but it'll come back to me at some point. But they were saying how, what would you do if you were on a deserted island, like it was just you? What would you be doing? What's the thing that you would do that you love to do the most? In my family, because academics and track were so important, that's what I valued. When I talked to people who grew up in art families, their families didn't give a shit about academics. They gave a shit about creativity. So that, what, what would you be doing on the island then? Right, making stuff, probably. Making stuff. Okay. <laughs> probably you'd be <laughs> yeah. making stuff because mm-hmm. it's interesting to you. You know, my thing is relationships, but <laughs> my relationship no. to myself and, you know, maybe yeah. the... No, no, like, no, but yeah. physically, like, what would you, Tazima, do on that oh, on that island yeah it's interesting i'd probably masturbate a lot <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably be trying to get closer to that the one. That would be a daily ritual, yeah, for probably, sure. Probably. <laughs> Most likely. Because I, I wouldn't be able to talk about relationships because it's just me and God or, yeah. you know, the universe or, or the island and the grains of sand. Right, I don't right. know. But I really love the humans. <laughs> yeah, so I had a little mm-hmm. bit of issue with the exercise because I'm like, yeah, I'm about yeah. relationship. Yeah, that would be really hard for you. So it's so funny because it when you said that, and I'm sorry that it interrupted sure, you. Sure, no, no, no. I, I love this question. Yeah. My immediate thought was just like me just laying on the sand with a journal. (laughs) Totally. And I'm like actually very content. (laughs) Absolutely. I could just read books and write. And I mean, it would be nice if I had some music to listen to. It would be nice. Yeah. But yeah, I would need some music actually. But other than that, I feel like I would be fine on a desert island. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess that makes me a true introvert. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Score for you. (laughs) But yeah. So with the baby, you have the baby who doesn't have to do any work. And then at some point, point, we feel that we need to prove ourselves, prove our worth, get scores, achieve something. It's a lie. It's a total lie that ends up determining our worth based on, and and our worth will translate again to money, love, all the things that we sort of value in our society, how popular you are, how many followers you have. You have to work in order to get any of those things. But everybody loves a baby. Everybody loves a baby. Well, except for people who don't. <laughs> but, <laughs> I was but most, a lot of people like a baby. some people who don't like happiness, sunshine, anything, puppies, you know, chocolate, you yeah. know, sex, Eeyore, like... The Eeyores of the world, you know. <laughs> no judgment, you know. It no takes judgment all, takes all. Yeah, yeah. It takes all the kinds. <laughs> but the point being is there was some point at which you decided I'm not enough to, I've got to prove something. I've got to work for love. I've got to, whatever that decision is, it's another one of those core mistaken beliefs that you got to work for it. 
you got to earn it. And getting out of that is pretty tricky. Again, lifetime journey. On my own journey, a lot of my worthiness slash letting myself off the hook for earning it was with being smart. And in years past, I would project a bunch of information. I would be like, I need to give the best possible information so that people will know I'm smart. And so here I am creating Mm -hmm. dissertations of information, you know, all this content, creating content. And I need to prove that I'm smarter than other people. And actually I'm going to prove these X, Y, and Z people wrong. And what I've been discovering over the past I don't know, probably kind of since the beginning of the year, this year. So this is pretty recent. By the way, it's never over, people. (laughs) So, (laughs) Oh, it's never. never I can't believe how it's never ending. It is fascinating. It's so fascinating. (laughs) How am I still working on this? (laughs) Exactly. How is this possible? (laughs) (laughs) So I would say over the past, I would say six months or so, I've been doing this experiment with what if I just told the truth? What if I just got super vulnerable and started revealing myself? Can I tell you the shift in how many people want to connect with me, how many people Mm. thank me from the bottom of their hearts. I had a woman. What's an example of something that you shared that was really scary for you to share? This past weekend, I did a presentation at a conference for non-monogamy here in Chicago. It's very, I'm so grateful to have been a part of that conference. And I decided to go ahead and tell about the 11 years between my breakup with my ex-husband and the marriage to my new husband. And during those years, I had a lot of fun and I had a lot of heartbreak. And some of those, the activities that I did included being into kink, BDSM. And, you know, I'm rattling this stuff off right now as if like, it's not scary. I promise you, my stomach is still in knots being like, don't say the thing, please don't say it. So it's still going on right now at this moment in this podcast. Part of me that's telling me not to say what I'm saying. So I also was involved in open relationships and I had a live in what's called a DS or dominant submissive relationship when I lived in San Francisco. And I was the dominant and I lived with a submissive, uh, very large man, (laughs) six, five, (laughs) wonderful, amazing human who was who was submissive to me. And I also had a lover who I would go to so that I could be submissive and he could be the dominant. And the Wow, you really are all about relationships. I am. You want, you want to just experience all of it. I did. That's amazing. I wow. really did. I really yeah. did. And so- I feel so vanilla. <laughs> I did all the things so you don't have to, and I'll give you the cliff notes. Thank you. <laughs> and so it, the, the, the thing that I was sharing it specifically at this session was that I am so grateful to have experienced myself authentically in both of these ways of relating at the same time. Usually mm-hmm. if you are a monogamous person, a serial monogamous, like I used to be, so I wasn't like this the whole time. I used to just date one person at a, at a time. I married yeah. one person and our relationship was closed. But mm-hmm. in this situation, this particular situation, I got to know aspects of myself and explore who I am with these two different people in these very different ways at the same time. So I could really be who I was. There wasn't like I was giving something up to be with the submissive, be a submissive. And there wasn't anything that I was amping up to be a dominant. It was all me. Me, but I got to experience it during the same time frame, which was such a gift for me to really understand, oh, part of the reason that relationship advice, all of it sucks is because it doesn't take into account the combination of the two or more people who are in the relationship. It just can't possibly do that because they don't know you. And so that's why it's super important for us to really assess what's happening between myself and this other human being, no matter who they are, whether it's a romantic relationship, you know, a professional relationship or a parent child relationship, any, any of these kinds of relationships, this, yeah. these aspects could be different, but being able to really experience deeply myself authentically in relationship with another was a massive, massive gift of that situation. So that is an example of something that I wouldn't have shared prior to, you know, six months ago, six months ago. Wow. That's huge. I mean, I applaud you. That is not easy. A lot of people would appreciate that because either there are just so few people who have those conversations publicly and it's, yeah, it's really helpful. We we all just feel so alone and isolated Mm -hmm. in whatever our particular story, mindset, situation, trauma, but there is literally no one 
who has, you're just never the only person who's feeling what you're feeling. <laughs> um, yes. And everyone, everyone has felt what you were feeling to some degree mm-hmm. at one time or another, and probably way more people than you know are, th- are feeling that right now. <laughs> and I, I think that part of worthiness and where val- our value comes from as humans is to recognize that, right? Have compassion for yourself, for your fellow human, that we all have these bullshit beliefs that we're not good enough, right? We all have that to some degree Mm -hmm. and recognize that commonality. You have that empathy for other people. Then I think it helps. It helps to have more empathy for yourself, right? Absolutely. And in, in this example that I just shared, I had to become, is part of the, the stop for me before I started sharing was this story, this mistaken belief in my head that has to do with very early in my sexual history of being violated, that if I tell, then they'll know what I did and I'll get in trouble. And that's mm-hmm. the thing that haunted me, you know, at 43 from yeah. when I was, you know, before, you know, way earlier, you know, when I was in single digits, if they find out what I did, then they'll know and then I'll get in trouble. It's decades that that has been haunting me. But the reward for the vulnerability of my sharing about not only what happened, you know, in the past, in the 11 years before I got married again, but also what happened with me and my the violation that I experienced when I was young is that other people can relate to me and other people can know, oh, she seems like she has it all together. No, I don't. <laughs> Just so you know, I don't. It's not all 100% together. It's never going to be. And I recognize that. But it makes me a more human human rather than some untouchable expert. I've lived it. And as I had a woman come up to me to relate, she was like, the difference between you and some other people that I've looked into is that you came from a lived experience. And I appreciate that. And so that was super validating to me. So as scary as it might be to share these vulnerable pieces when we feel like we're not worthy, the cool part of working with this vulnerability is that I get more connection. Yeah. And that's what we're all looking for. That's that's what we're all looking for. And I think that when you think about who do you feel safe with emotionally, it has to be somebody who has that ability to share their vulnerabilities like like a person who doesn't share anything of themselves is not doesn't feel safe because (laughs) that you know like if you if you have shame and you have judgment towards yourself you're going to project that onto other people yep period right releasing some of this shame and some of this judgment that we have about ourselves we then attract so much such deeper and more authentic relationships with other people. Absolutely. Because we become a place of safety for each other. Yep. I yeah. I think that's what romantic relationship is actually about. It's finding enough another safe person in the world where you can really get naked, <laughs> literally yeah. and figuratively. Literally and fi- yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree with that. I love that. I love that. We should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Gotta do it. Any silk screening um, <laughs> folks in the, in the audience listening? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Get at yes. Me. My friends, my friends at Hit and Run, Hit and Run here in Los Angeles. Awesome. Little plug. Awesome. <laughs> I guess for anybody who is listening and we talked, you touched a bit on the the beginning, kind of like the difference between confidence and worthiness, right? And I I think that this is an important distinction for a lot of people who are like, no, listen, I know that I'm dope. I know that I'm beautiful. I know that I'm smart. I know like they have confidence in all of these different aspects of themselves. And because they have so much confidence in, in these certain aspects, they can't see that they still have this fundamental false narrative inside that somehow they're not just worthy just because they are who they are, like not because of all these other outside things. And I don't know, what are your thoughts about that, advice about that? Because you and I work with a similar population of women, you know, professional women who do have to have some confidence. Otherwise, (laughs) you know, they wouldn't have their jobs. They wouldn't have the lives that they have. This one is going to sting. (laughs) because it stung me it stung it stung so bad it was so like ugh. it's one of those like you know when you get something really sensitive pinched by something very tiny like a hinge or you know something yeah that like ah, 
<laughs> that, that's how this stings. When people, and I'll talk, speak for myself, w- one of the things that I had in my confidence was superiority. Mm. I was like, I'm so good at X, Y, and Z. You know, I'm mm-hmm. fucking number one. I have worked so hard on this. The root of superiority and excellence is inferiority. Yes. We are over compensating, period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And unless we're ready to admit that, yeah. it's massive. The mm-hmm. best, most accomplished people usually have some driving force behind them that looks like uh, people are going to find out it's a sham. Or yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's some piece of me that, like, there's always a shit talker inside always. your head <laughs> always, that drives always. you to it. If you're mm-hmm. driven to superiority or to excellence because of the shit talker in your head, mm-hmm. because of inferiority. It to is, be clear, yeah. if you see someone who's highly achieving, it's just that they're taking more action usually than other people. The people who are underachieving are letting the shit talker get the best of them pretty <laughs> right, much. Right. Yeah, it's but it's two sides of the same coin. I mean, I mean, this was a revelation for me as well. For me, this this insight came from Eckhart Tolle and A New Earth and understanding the ego and how it works. And like, you know, it is just as egotistical to think that you're the best person in the world as it is to think that you are the biggest piece of shit in the world. It's the same thing. <laughs> it is the same lie that your ego is telling you to try to, you know, keep you separate from other people. That That is, I think when people can really understand that because we are so outwardly focused. So if somebody is like standing there like, I'm the best, look at me, hey, hey, look at how sexy I am on Instagram, that everyone's like, oh my God, that's how they feel about themselves. And I'm like, why do you think that? (laughs) Like, we gotta start looking, we actually gotta start looking beneath the surface here, people, right? Like, this is, all is not what it appears to be. But we have so much more in common than we realize. I also wanna say that's not a bad thing. It's not, if you're overcompensating, it just is. is. It's not a bad Mm -hmm. thing. I'm thinking right now about as we take it into relationship, as we take it into dating, as we take it into our interactions with others, specifically, you know, even if we're married or in a long-term commitment, relationship, whatever the situation is, that stuff keeps playing out just with different subjects, just in different ways and different manifestations of the same same. thing Mm -hmm. over and over again. So Mm -hmm. that's why it's so critical that you get a hold of what it is for you. It's individual. It's every single person has their own thing. And don't feel like, you know, your your situation is worse than another person's. It's not. And it's not a bad thing for you to have this. And it's not no shame. Don't use this information on this podcast to see. I knew it. I I (laughs) knew (laughs) it. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. No, no need to do that. <laughs> it'll it'll do its own job on you. <laughs> your your job is to have more compassion for yourself and um, to right. make different decisions. All we do is make meaning for ourselves. We make things mean. Nothing means anything. We're the ones who assign the meaning to shit. Like it would, you know, the person cutting you off in traffic doesn't mean they're, they might be an asshole, but it's not about you getting to your next appointment. It's just, they might be having a bad day. You don't know. And yeah. the only reason why you're concerned about that is because you're anxious, mm-hmm. you know, about whatever mm-hmm. is going on with you. Take the judgment off. My invitation here is to take the judgment off of any of the stuff that we're saying. Just know that it is, and you can take steps steps to create something different for yourself by by knowing about it. Absolutely. Yes. I'm glad you said that because not judging yourself, I frame it as having Mm self-compassion, which is like the drum that I'm always beating because I think it's such an underrated life skill and it's so hard to get over your own shit if you cannot, like, I don't know if it's possible actually to get over your own shit if you, if you're not able to be compassionate towards yourself. I just, I don't know how you would do it otherwise. And, you know, I want everybody to get over their shit so we can and just be happier on this planet. Seriously. <laughs> Lord knows. I mean, seriously, seriously. Oh my goodness. Well, this has been so fabulous talking to you and getting your wisdom. And do you have any parting thoughts on 
our conversation today? Yes, I actually do. One thing you'll notice when you start getting into relationships or or you're in a relationship with someone, I will specifically use romantic relationships because I think they're the best for being able to get at some of the subjects we've been talking about today, the yeah, worthiness. They're the best teachers. Oh, they will bring it up. They bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever your trigger is, know that and expect that the person who is the corresponding trigger for that is going to be one of the richest relationship opportunities for you. I'll give you an example so to bring it home. My husband has a trigger called you're withholding information or you're keeping secrets. I have a trigger, leave me alone. I don't need you to know everything that's going on with me. Sure that never comes up. Oh boy. <laughs> So as you can imagine, (laughs) it gets tricky. And what me just living kind of normal life is a particular trigger for him. And then I feel put upon to like reveal everything about my life. You know, (laughs) it is literally the same trigger, but I call it yin yang trigger dance in relationship. Mm -hmm. So whatever your unworthiness is, don't a lot of people will get out of relationship because they feel triggered by the person. Part of the reason that we get triggered in our romantic relationships is so that we can bring this stuff up so that we can heal it, address it, get used to it, learn to work with it in more effective ways, develop ways of being that don't have those ideas and those mistaken beliefs running our lives. And the best practice form for this, I think, is romantic relationship. I have not seen any long-term romantic relationship yet that doesn't have a version of this where the two people are matching up some aspect of mistaken belief that they're connected in some way. And I don't want people to be afraid of that. I actually want you to see that as an opportunity, whether it's a short-term relationship or a longer-term relationship. Well, that's the thing. It's like, yes, you're always going to be triggered by your partner, even in, you know, the quote unquote, best, most loving, respectful, compatible, all of those things. But obviously some people, most people are getting into relationships because they are succumbing to a really negative pattern and dysfunctional dynamic. Just, I wouldn't want anybody who's in a situation that is highly dysfunctional and toxic to feel like, okay, well, I'm being triggered all the time. (laughs) This is good. This is not about justifying dysfunction. It's not. (laughs) That's our coaching disclaimer, everyone. (laughs) If someone is really abusive to you. Because we are so good at justifying dysfunction. This is not about justifying dysfunction at all. It's about Mm -hmm. when you, this is why I help women specifically with their relationship vision. And I know that uh, Francesca, you do another, you do a version of like Mm -hmm. looking forward. What is the ideal situation for you? Even when you attract that ideal person. And I'm talking about Mm -hmm. healthy, you're hot for each other. (laughs) You know, you you have all the good things, (laughs) you know, similar goals and principles, all of those pieces. This person is going to also come with a a gem. Let's call it a gem. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, you know what? We're going to tell ourselves a story. Let's tell a good one. So they're going to come with a gem that is going to correspond to your gem, which is your trigger. Because whatever your trigger is, is actually a gem. It's a tremendous opportunity to learn and grow and be with, you know, be with someone one and overcome and have them watch you go through like when you're flipping out and and you feel like yeah. everything is terrible and then they're still there loving you it's so it's so rewarding and validating to have that experience like oh wow this person is really not going anywhere okay cool so we're talking about healthy yeah. relationships healthy connection aligned relationship where you are on the same team you are moving forward together and then there is gem to gem baby gem to gem baby gem to gem <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so remember that even in the best relationships, you're you're going to come up against your your stuff. And it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's the teamwork yeah. makes the dream work. Well, gems are beautiful. It's actually a wonderful metaphor. They're beautiful. They were formed under a lot of pressure. It took a very, very, very specific set of conditions, rare conditions, to produce that particular gem. And that's, that is really, that's absolutely fantastic metaphor for what we're talking about. Oh, my goodness. We are gems, aren't we? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, Tazima Paris, thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. Listeners, please connect with and follow Tazima. She is on Instagram at Tazima Paris. That's Paris with two R's. Your website is infinitrelating.com. Uh, you're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tazima. And I'm going to link to all of your social media and the show notes. So everyone, make sure you check on the show notes. You can just click right through to check out Tazima and connect with her. Please be sure to check the show notes for links to Tazima's social media, as well as her website. You can stay in touch with me on all social media platforms at Dear Franny, and you can follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at Dear Franny Podcast. I would love to hear from you. So really do like shoot me a message, a DM. Let me know what you're enjoying. Let me know the kinds of conversations you'd like to hear in the future. Let me know if you think you'd be an amazing guest because I'm totally open to that as well. All right. Thank you so much. If you like the podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. I'd be really grateful. i also be really grateful for ratings and reviews. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to spend a bit of it with me and enjoy the rest of your day or night wherever you are in the world. Goodbye.